So this is a beta talk, uh, which is interesting. Like, I've never actually given a beta talk. This talk is actually going to be given at a Cinca camp uh, in October. So you're getting an early preview. Specifically, uh, there is some technical stuff we're working through, um, and I'm asking for some early feedback. So certainly, like, uh, if you have some feedback about this, things you like, things you didn't, I'm actually very interested in this because it's going to go in front of a, a much larger audience here soon. So you know, thanks for letting me try it out here. Hopefully, we get something awesome out of it. So. Uh, the first of which is like, who am I and why am I talking to you, right? Um, my name's James Fryman. Uh, I am an I am a what, what am I called, Evan? Now I'm a an evangelist or inspirational stormer at Stackstorm. I inspire Evan, my CEO. Uh, so I uh, have been at Stackstorm now for uh, about nine months, and I've been working with the Stackstorm team for almost two years now. Uh, before Stackstorm, and I'm going to talk about what Stackstorm is, given that it's in the title, so I'll come back to that. Uh, before that, I actually worked for two years at GitHub, where the term chat ops originated. Uh, and I'm a very huge proponent of chat ops, right? Everywhere I go and everything I do, is about trying to figure out how to make people work more efficiently. And once I got to GitHub and I saw how they pushed the bounds of chat ops specifically and how they worked with bots and integrated into doing their day-to-day -day operations, you know, look, there's no really other way to work, I promise you. And if you don't if you don't work like this yet and you're thinking about working like this, I promise you. If you try this out, you won't want to work another way again. So that being said, I just real quick want to take a quick quick poll of hands. Who has heard of chat ops before? Okay, who's using chat ops in some capacity in their organization? Okay, so this is a good population. I mean, I like that. That makes me very happy. So Stackstorm, this is where I work. And like I said, I will talk a lot about this, uh, hopefully in good terms, so we like it. But first of all, like, what even is this chat ops thing, right? And this is, these are folks who, who everybody seems to know about chat ops, so this is for the benefit of our folks who will be watching this later down the road. Uh, you know, first of all, it's like, it, these are great slides that I got from my friend uh, Jason Hand here, so I appreciate this. But like, chat ops is, is more or less taking the work that you're already doing and jamming it into the conversations that you're already having. What happens today is when you have to go do work somewhere, right? You go talk about that work, and then in some other channel, whatever that channel may be, maybe it's in meet space, maybe you're sending emails, maybe you have you are talking about it in chat, but you're not actually doing the work there. You actually go off into your silos, do some magic, and then come back and report your status, right? Everybody takes your word on it because there's some work output, but nobody really sees what's going on while you're doing that work. Maybe if you've got good ticket tracking, people can kind of keep up to status of what's going on, but there's still a disconnect between the conversations that people are having and the work that people are doing. And this, what chat ops does is essentially removes that barrier and smushes the two together, right? And, and how you do this, right, it starts with chat. And believe it or not, a lot of folks just don't even have chat still, right? And which is kind of a blowing, mind-blowing concept, especially in San Francisco. But you know, you walk out of this, out of the Bay Area, and suddenly you walk into companies that you know, email's a tough thing for them, right? And you're like, what even is happening? But you know, based, the first step is like getting one of these chat platforms, right? Talking to some, some each other, not in meet space, and that could be anything from HipChat to Slack, the big new hot player in town. Uh, FlowDoc, that's a really cool one. Uh, Campfire, old classic, and then IRC, old trusty, right? You know, there's plenty of other ways to do this in between. Some folks have to use Microsoft Link. I feel very bad for them, but you know, it exists. But there's other, you know, like the first concept being is you have to have some sort of, let's call it a message bus to talk to each other. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull that back up again. And the second of which is there's usually a bot component associated with this, right? You're not talking to a computer directly. There's something, some piece of code that sits in and listens to your human responses and tries to map those to some sort of technical command, right? And that's usually the function of the bot. And those bots, there's a couple of them out there in the world, right? We've got Lita, right? Lita is written by Jimmy, right? We've got Hubot, which is written by the GitHub team and still managed by GitHub, specifically by uh, Technical Pickles. Uh, Ur is another plug. Oh, yeah, thank you, yeah. And uh, um, Ur is written in Python. And then Laszlo, I, I, there's an asterisk here about Laszlo. I've, I've only heard about Laszlo today, but apparently it's a... Um, it's in Go? I thought it was in um, Lua. 
No, it's Go. So it's in Go. All right. So there's there, pick a language, right? Like depending on what works and what frameworks you're already using in your company, it's usually good to align yourself with code that you're already doing, right? One of the big parts of ChatOps is trying to pull people in from other places other than IT operations into doing your into doing and being part of this community, and that means picking the tools that work for your company, right? And the good news is there are different tools in different languages, and you kind of kind of pick and choose. And certainly each of these communities have different amounts of community plugins that have been contributed. You know, I certainly would like to say that Hubot probably has the most with Lita at very close second. You know, Lita's a, a newer project, uh, but you know, the folks at Loathe CoffeeScript quickly ran over to there. Uh, and you know, certainly Ur is probably like a distant third with, you know, maybe a dozen plugins, but it still does the needful, right? It sits on these chat rooms, it listens for messages, and then it sends it somewhere, right? This kind of event-driven thing. And that's a theme I'm going to talk about a little bit too. So these bots are these bots are usually part of the equation. But what's really important to, to notice, right? And hopefully I'm using these slides appropriately, is that bots aren't 100% necessary, right? The bot is just a function. It's some code that's sitting there. But bots are only part of the equation, right? The bot is the how do you send information and kick off things through chat ops. But chat ops is just as much of just as much of consuming information as it is kicking off information. And so you may not even have bots like this in the world today, right? Slack, for instance, is a big kind of player in this space now, where they're exposing webhooks to pretty much every service in the entire world, creating these integrations. And just by virtue of shoving information into chat, the passive consuming information is just as important as kicking off these commands and going doing active things. Right? So bots aren't 100% necessary and may not even be part of the initial equation as you start to figure out what chat ops means for you and your organization. Right? So like, why would I even do some chat ops? Certainly there's a lot of benefits here, sharing being the big one. Right? Immediately as soon as you implement chat ops, you have instant transparency within your organization. Right? People can see what you're doing, you can see what other people are doing. It just becomes cutting out middlemen of all kinds. Things go really fast all of a sudden. And learning is a huge component of this too. Right? We as humans, you know, we have hundreds of thousands or tens of hundreds of years, depending on your, your belief in this, like how long we've been here. And over those years, we have created a very strong oral tradition. Right? And only recently, with the digital revolution, are we starting to move toward these technology devices. And it's a little challenging from a social perspective to, to just how we work as humans, even though we've got these new tools. It's going to take some time. So we naturally want to lend ourselves to go into using this human behavior. I mean, we even have a term for it. What do you call it? Uh, tribal knowledge, institutional behavior. Right? We just kind of veneer over and go, OK, it's there. Right? While the meanwhile, we're trying to do the right thing by creating documentation and using some tools to like capture this knowledge, but in reality, we're still wired to share it this way. But once you have chat ops as part of the equation, you can actually leverage that to your benefit. People can go and do commands in this chat op room, and you don't even have to train people. You just put them in this room and say, just sit here for a little bit. And if you don't know what's going on after this, maybe we have a different talk conversation. But for the most part, you can just walk in and get historical information about how anybody did anything. At GitHub, I was able to go look back over five years of chat ops commands. And sometimes I didn't even know how subsystems worked because they were so ancient and so old. But guess what? Somebody did, and there's a log of it. And that's huge. Being able to get a new employee all together, pop them in a room, and have them have some amount of knowledge almost immediately, Oh, pfft, that's amazing. And then on top of that, as they consume and learn the language of your company, they're also learning how to operate your systems. Huge. Um, you know, there's certainly a couple other things. Uh, speed of, of moving around, like that's you're just going to get accelerated. You know, we talked about this cutting out your middlemen. Uh, security for sure, right? Um, and I know Michael's going to talk about the specific security angle of this. But when you have chat ops, right, you're exposing small subset of commands to your entire audience. And you know these companies that write tools, they write tools for the every man and the every woman, right? They say, I want this feature and this feature and this feature for company X, and you're not going to use any of these things. You know, there's a thousand features in this tool, and in reality, you bought it for seven. Well, if you expose those seven commands and you do it in a safe way, well, suddenly everybody can have access to those commands. And you know, when people execute them, you know they're going to execute consistently. They're going to execute with the same amount of trust, and then theoretically, you know, not do the wrong things. Right. Uh, brainstorming and fun is certainly fun, right? When you're having a bad day, you can call up a quick cat picture and cheer up anybody. 
And maybe if they're not a cat person, they can be a dog person, right? You know, or whatever, a koala person. We learned about this last night. Uh, but certainly, like, there's as much a social aspect to chat ups as there is a technical aspect, right? Being able to kind of quip and have fun and let off some steam in the middle of serious incidents by pulling up pugs or cats or something, right? So much part of the equation as well. So talked a little bit about chat ops, right? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Stackstorm and how it falls into this equation, right? So we're really big on this event-driven automation idea, right? The idea about event-driven automation is that we're going to take events from different tools that exist in the world, these things you want to integrate with, these things that chat ops are going to go either receive events for or go and execute. We're going to listen for these events in what we call our sensor layer, and then we're going to go match those against rules. And from those rules, we're going to emit triggers into our system and then go execute commands, which call out to these different tools, which then send us back information, and this giant loop ensues. So you know, don't gloss over this too much. right? If this confuses the heck out of you, it's fine. We're going to go piecemeal over this and how it specifically applies. But I wanted to show you this in particular because you know, what we're doing and how Stackstorm plays on this is we actually put a veneer. You know, in the Git community, they use this term porcelain and plumbing. So the plumbing in our term is this. This is the plumbing that happens behind Stackstorm. And specifically, we designed this this way because we want to make sure that we're dealing with ability to scale large, concurrent operations, security built in and baked in, be able to manage and track audit and history. Like these features don't exist in full yet within a single bot framework. Right? Pieces and bits of them, and you have to customize them exist. But if you want to like have hardcore operations, you're building some sort of queuing system. Right? I think Michael's actually going to talk specifically about this, right? how he wired these things up. Well, you can't just buy this or build this. It takes some amount of time unless you try Stackstorm. And I'll talk more about this as well. And then there's the chat ops component. The chat ops component is what we call our porcelain. So the porcelain sits on top of the plumbing. And this is the actual thing that gets exposed to our users. So within our concept, we have this thing called actions. And the actions are the things that go and get executed. We also have this concept called aliases. And the aliases are how we map the ways that people talk about things in chat to the actions we want to have executed within the context of Stackstorm. So as far as we're concerned, a bot, specifically Hubot today, we're actually working on adapters for Lita. Hopefully that should be out within the next two weeks or so. Uh, and then Ur will get to at some point. You know. But uh, at least Hubot today calls into Stackstorm and says, what aliases have you made available? What mappings have you mapped between the actions that you know how to do, which could include simple things like go open an issue in JIRA, go open an issue in GitHub, or it could be complex things like go provision me a server, go get me a DNS name. We have a lot of these things coming out of the box. right? So you map an action to an alias. Hubot gets notification of what these aliases are and how you want to ask Hubot for these things, the language with which you want to use, and then sends that information up to Stackstorm. So as far as your concerns, the user, you're only going to see the human readable things. Please go get me a new server. I need to go get this graph. And on the back end, we're handling all that dirty magic. Right? As far as you're concerned, the bot is a magical person. And that's how we want you to think. Right? If you're a technical person, we want you to be able to dig into this. If you're a non-technical person, we want you to be able to consume this. I'll show you all the different pieces of this. So there's a quick story that's associated with this before I dive too much into this. Uh, and I'm going to change the names of the application and the users uh, until I get permission to use them. And since we, everybody in the world loves cats, I'm going to call this application CatCam. So there was this application, CatCam. And the, the company wanted to go and say, we need this application up. And this application is, is a, what they call a tier two application. Right? The application is important. They want it up. But if it goes down, and there's a, another application that goes down in their organization that like, generates revenue, they're going to go after the revenue generation application to make sure it's working. But as a close second, they're going to go after this tier two application. We'll call it CatCam. Because guess what? People like to look at cats, and it makes them happy. And it's a huge instant hit. It had the right features to, to, to just inspire the user base that they just wanted cat cam up all the time. Well, when these applications get pushed out in a very kind of quick manner, and that never happens, right? There's never time functions or functions of uh, shipping. You know, like every application that gets released is perfect, right? No, no. 
Yes. And there's problems that exist because of that, right? And these are the operations problems that chat ops can start to help and fix for you. And namely, like, okay, now operation teams, I've got this new application. I've got this cat cam has been handed to me, and I can never, ever get rid of it again. I have to add it to my service cadre of things that I have to manage forever and ever and ever again. And then on top of that, when people call me, when something happens, if I was just any kind of nice to the person I was helping out, I'm their best bud from now on because I know how to fix computers. They're going to call me. Right? And that's like, like, I feel good about that. I'm glad that I'm making people happy and they're getting their job done. But guess what doesn't scale? Tens of thousands of people calling me or another person, right? It just doesn't work that way. But humans want to talk to humans, right? We're built for this. I want to go and have a real relationship with the person because I know that when I go to Michael and I say, hey, can you get this thing for me? He's going to deliver. Right? And these are the kind of relationships. And so when you're thinking about this in the context of the bot, this is equally important too. Can your bot deliver? Because now this application goes down, and not only do you have to deliver, you have to make sure that everybody knows that it's delivering in the way that's applicable to your company or business unit. Right? The way people communicate is just as important as what's actually getting done. And so these, all these concepts come into play with actually creating the bot. So I have a talk online already. I'll actually refer you to it at the end of it. It's called The Philosophy of Chat Ops. It's, you know, it's a nice little talk. It tells you about like, how to build things, what you should be thinking about. And the feedback I got from that talk was, that's great. Now, how do I get started with chat ops? And usually the story goes like this. Chat ops is awesome. Oh, I agree. Chat ops is awesome. Well. Now you get to go build an entire platform for how to integrate a bot framework into your entire organization. And the chasm between start and some amount of chat ops is so wide today that unless you're really invested in trying to get this done, it's just not going to happen. Right? These are really great ideas we're talking about, and it's a lot of energy and a lot of work. And certainly, bot authors are trying to make this easier. Right? But we run into an n factorial problem. Any new application that I want to integrate with, I now have to create a plugin for that bot. OK, well, now if I want that, that application to talk to another application, do I proxy it through my bot? Do I proxy it through another tool? Do I have that tool talk to the other tool that I want to integrate with? And usually what happens is the latter, because you don't have some sort of central subsystem to manage the communication between all these things. And so now, what starts out as relatively easy becomes unburdened or becomes unmanageable because suddenly you're spending more time managing the automation than you are managing and getting things done. It just kind of burdens you. It becomes such a big thing and then people ditch it and this idea of chat up suddenly is gone within your organization. Right? It takes a lot of energy, a lot of focus, and a lot of desire to do this. And it, it's still early. It's still early for us, right? There's 30 of us in this room. In two years, there'll be 300. But we got to start working on this. This time, this talk, more of a technical talk, because I'll actually show you how to do these things with StackStorm. So let's talk about the first step, right? Something fails, and you want to, like, you need to let your users know, CatCam has gone down. And they're going to call me. They're going to call you, because CatCam's out. And I can't see Vladimir the Cat, because Vladimir the Cat is amazing. He makes me feel calm every time I see him. But now I can't see him, and I'm stressed, and I want it fixed, IT person. Go fix it. Right? And it's not that they don't trust you to do it. They just want to know that somebody has acknowledged their problem and is trying to fix it. That's all they really care about. And how that manifests itself in today's organizations turns out to be some person who sits and writes email blasts to everybody in the organization. This thing is still broken. We're working on it. ETA, 20 minutes. I was that guy for two years writing those emails to 10,000 people. It blows. Not awesome, right? But again, it's not that they don't trust you. They want to know that, number one, you know that there's a problem. You've acknowledged it, and you're doing something about it. That's all they really care about, and you need some common way to do that. So let's start with creating our first integration. So we're going to create an integration from Isinga to StackStorm. So specifically, we want to know CatCam goes down. Well, how do I know and in what ways it goes down? Right? So we have a tool. You can go download this within our platform. Download a pack, and that pack comes with a thing that you plug into your monitoring system, specifically either Nagios or Asinga. We also have a Sensu uh, plugin for this. And you go download this thing, and you plug it in your monitoring system, and suddenly every event that happens in the monitoring system gets sent to StackStorm. Well, great. We got all these events. Now what? What do, 
what do I do with that? Like you're sending me now a fire hose of alerts? That's not helpful for anybody. And specifically, I only really care about cat cam. Why would I hook up an entire monitoring platform when all I want is the cat? I just want the cat. Well, we have to create our first rule. So Stackstorm starts with sending fire hose of things to it, right? Pick an app, pick a tool, doesn't matter. Send everything you can to it. We can handle it. It's totally cool. I don't know if you saw that architecture slide up in front. We built it for it, right? It's cool. Send everything to it. Well, these things are emitted as triggers into our system. And each trigger has a specific payload associated with it from the tool that we integrate with. We have a quick and easy way to like mapping a tool that you have. We have uh, something, something like over 1,000 integrations of different tools right now, continuing to grow every day. Right? Send some sort of payload into the system. And then we create a rule and say, well, what do we want to do as a result of that? So we create a rule. I don't know if you can see this. We use YAML at most of our layers to represent rules, actions, and action aliases. And the reason for that is we want, we want to be able to separate the action authors from the action consumers. Today, that is a tightly integrated thing. If I want to write a bot plugin, I have to go know how to write in the language of the bot, and I have to understand the integration, and then I have to go plug those two things together. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to say, if you know a subsystem, whatever that subsystem may be, maybe it's Cassandra, maybe it's MySQL, maybe it's insert monitoring tool, insert security tool, whatever. You can write with whatever language you're happiest with as an action and then expose it within Stackstorm. And so then what we can do is and we can say, when these alerts come through, we're now going to have triggers emitted to the system. And we want to say, when a service state change occurs, what are we going to look for? And we can match these against multiple criteria, multiple ands. In any way we want to match against this, could be regular expressions, could be greater or less than, like very easy to say, how many of these criteria do I want to associate with? And then what do I want to go do as a result of that? Right? The next step being could be a single action, could be a multitude of actions, what we call workflows. Right? So you can go kick off multiple things. And then we go say, hey, what are we going to go do? In this case, I'm actually kicking off a single action. And I'm saying, when an alert comes in, I want somebody to know. And I'm going to take all the information that came from my payload, and I'm using Jinja templating here right, to do variable interpolation, and jam this into a message that gets sent to my Slack channel. Cool. It's specifically CAD CAM, because people care about that. They're trolling in that channel. They want to make sure they can see Vladimir. Right? Awesome. So now, now this event stream, as it's being sent to it from my monitoring system, matches against these rules, creates an, it creates an action we call task, and it goes and does this thing. And again, I'm censoring names until I get permission. You know how that goes. But now you have visibility for everybody. You've solved the first problem of now everybody can see when something occurred. Well, you kind of have a different problem now, now that everybody knows that you know that there's a problem. So you're kind of going to be held accountable. And that's a good thing, though, right? They see that you're going to go do something. They see that you're working on it. You're not getting nagged about it. You can go do your job. You can restore services. Everybody's happy. They get to see Vladimir. Who's not happy after that? I mean, come on. So the next step would be, would be sending and telling the next step. We now know about this. So in Nagios, there's actually a tool already that can do this. Um, we're working on this integration. And we're currently working directly with the Asinga team right now. So I can't actually acknowledge an alert right now in Asinga, uh, specifically because their API doesn't allow sending commands yet. They're working on that. We should have that done by the time we actually present this thing in October. But the idea being is that you should be able to tell your bot with one of these actions, I have acknowledged this alert and send it through to the monitoring system. And it says, OK, now everybody knows that James has done something. Well, by virtue of the fact that I've already got the rule, even if I have to go to the web UI, I'm at least letting people know. I haven't had to change anything. I still have to leave the context of the chat, but that will change soon. right? But the power here is now everybody sees that I've done something about this. They see I've acknowledged the alert, and I'm working on it. They can rest easy that Vladimir will be back soon. Awesome. Now, the other cool thing about this is that you're, now you're able to expose tools that normally wouldn't be exposed to developers or operations people in some cases or non-technical people altogether. Right? If you've ever seen the Asinga console or, God forbid, the Nagios console, those things are like atrocious pieces of software. Like, I don't know how they exist. They've served their purpose. And like 1999 wants their website back, truthfully, right? 
But now you say, look, developer, who is used to working with rounded corners and fast responding web pages, go play with Nagios. They're just going to say, no, nah, that's your job, guy. I'm out, right? Well, not with chat ops, because you've created good constructs for them to go and execute these things in the context of chat. And if I can acknowledge an alert with a single, with a single command, why couldn't they? Now, it becomes an interesting problem, though, that you have to deal with. It's because now you're creating a UX kind of mapping. It's trying to figure out how would users interact with this thing, right? And I'm going to talk about that in a second, too. But the other pieces here is that you, you're able to give back control to the users, right? The users who necessarily may or may not even have known they could have this control, right? I don't want to manage this application forever. And by using constructs like chat ops, I can actually partner with people who are writing these applications and consuming these applications, then I can actually give control back to them. Now, it's kind of underhanded a little bit because people like inherently want to have control of their stuff, but they end up having to cede control over because they don't have the tool set or the tool chain to manage the things. And so ops gets left with that burden. That's just how it goes, right? This is, this is the cycle we're in. But suddenly, now if I'm mapping these commands and giving them back to users, they can take control again, and they'll want to do it, right? And we use those, we do this with runners. So how we would do runners is I'm actually going to talk about how we would imp, you know, integrate the different tools into your, into your environment. So what is an action? We talked about a rule. Now I'm going to go kick off one of these actions. What kind of action can I kick off? Well, we have these runners that talk to systems in different ways. We have a local runner that will execute commands on the local server or action runner concept, like so whatever's locally running. We have a remote runner, which will remotely log into servers via SSH and run commands. We have a Python runner, which will natively call Python libraries and go execute them. So that's really good for like, you know, I've got to go talk to weird protocol stuff, like, I don't know, MySQL, or uh, there's not a really great API wrapper for that thing, so I'm going to call up the request library to go do something amazing. Um, we have a direct HTTP runner, so if somebody has written a well-designed RESTful API, we can actually just go talk to that directly. And then if you happen to be running Windows in your environment, I am very sorry, but we can handle that too, so that's cool. But what do these things, one of these things look like? So in the single world, there's actually a command that we want to slurp into our system in order to show what's happening in the Asinga system. And that command is called Asinga CLI. So from the single CLI, I can actually say, hey, what commands are executing? And now I want that command to be available as a chat ops command, right? But first I have to make it available to SACStorm. So again, this concept of plumbing versus, versus porcelain. So we first of all have to establish the plumbing for it. And again, this is YAML, and this is an action runner, or this is a runner definition that says, what kind of runner am I going to use? What is it going to go do? And then what command is it going to go execute? This is relatively straightforward, right? And there's not a lot happening here. But as a matter of fact, with each runner, we have a ton of extra metadata that you can pass along with it. What servers do I log into? What usernames and passwords do I use? Where do I need to be running these things? And each of the different runners comes with different constructs to figure out in what context and how do I need to execute this application that I'm absorbing. So with this, with this action metadata here, I can suddenly now tell Stackstorm, you now know how to view the alerts on Asinga. And when I go run that command, I actually get a structured payload back. So one of the big things within Stackstorm is that we return everything in a structured, consistent object. So even if you're running a command from a command line, right, something that doesn't return structured data back to you via JSON, we can actually still slurp that in through standard in, standard out, and expose that as a, as a structured object. Right? This hopefully will be a much better slide by the time I present it again. But you should be able to see like I have execution IDs associated with it, the status of those executions, and then all the different things that occurred a bit, and there's, you know, there's more, more down here. Just imagine there's more down here. Um, but I can use this structure payload, which we speak JSON throughout an entire stack. So I can use this and pass it along to other different actions. So it's very easy to start to chain together different actions as I pass data from one step to another step to another step. And I'll come into play with workflow. I'll talk about that in a second. But isn't this a chat ops meetup? Have I talked anything about chat ops yet? Sorry. All right. Let's talk about that now. So how do you, what do you do today, right? So when I talk about like, I need to go fix a service, I got cat cam down, what usually ends up happening is we create some sort of playbook. It's a wiki article, it's a Word document, it's something. 
And then when I get the phone call or I get the context interruption, I go log on to these servers or maybe I execute a script and I fix it. Well, now we create a script or an alias, map it to that thing within Stackstorm, and then suddenly it's exposed via chat ops. So a couple design rules. The first thing, you need to describe the service, right? Don't describe tools, describe services. So like CI, not Jenkins. Graph, not, uh, uh, ooh. Graphite, thank you, Graphite or uh, OpenTSDB, right? The second piece is like, now you actually have to figure out how folks communicate. How do I, what is it actually going to expose to chat ops? Because it turns out your folks in your organization are gonna communicate in wildly different ways. And I can actually do that kind of discovery with Stackstorm. So I've actually created a rule here, and this is a very relatively simple rule that says, from the fire hose that is Slack, if there is any text message that comes through that happens to include the word camera and broken or not working, just jam it into this text file. Well, that could go somewhere else. Maybe that could go to a MySQL server. Maybe that could go to another chat room that you just happen to be logging. But suddenly, now I'm starting to collect how people are bitching about cat cam being down. Well, that's good, right? Because now, in the next step, I can actually create what we call our action alias. And this is the thing that makes it available to, to Hubot. This is the chat ops magic sauce. And it's very simple, right? It says there's an action that I want to call, which is the go clean camera. So in this case, we found out through all this monitoring that every time the cat cam broke, the file system actually filled up. Ah, oh, too many images of cats, darn, right? Now we got to go clean some up, right? So we create an action and we say, go clean up that thing. Here's what the help is happening, and then what formats do I want to expose to the users? What chat ops commands are going to be asked for, and in what context? And here I'm going to say, if I say camera's clean, and then here's some arbitrary data that I'm going to jam into the host attribute that I would pass to this action, Qbot will go, oh, I actually know what that is, because Stackstorm told me. I'm going to grab that, dereference the action alias, and send it as an action to Stackstorm, Stackstorm's gonna go do all the magic. Hubot at that point just kind of chills. Hey, I'm happy, you need some cats, I'm waiting for it. And asynchronously, as we execute these tasks and as we get data back, we're telling Hubot, hey, we're done, hey, we're done, and he'll let you know. And help is huge about this. Like, it actually starts like this. So whenever I create one of these action aliases, you'll notice that it creates these commands that you all see in here with uh, the interpolation that I would be able to do and the help description. So as I'm self-documenting this stuff in this YAML, it's already self-documenting for the users. So this infrastructure's code concept becomes super important for us, right? The breadcrumbs of having to keep the wiki article and your, and your actual operations is gone now because we're actually executing in code the things that are going to go you're asking for, right? And if it's wrong and you update the code, guess what? Now your documentation is up to date because you fixed your code. Super awesome concept. And then when you go execute it, he goes and says, or she, he or she, our bot is a she, we like she, we like that. Hey, here's an execution alias, here's some IDs, and then the data starts coming at you. Just fast, fast, fast like that. And as soon as you commit that alias to Stackstorm and you say, hey, here's the alias, Hubot goes, okay. And now you've got new commands available. It's as simple as that. You know, up until this point, to be able to wire up an arbitrary command to, to, to two a chat ops, there's a huge barrier there, right? Okay, now I've got to integrate it with my, my bot. Now I've got to figure, think about what security means if it's just outside of my little concept, right? Now I've got to go figure out what scalability means. I've got to go figure out all of these things. We want to boil it down to there's an alias and there's a way to slurp in commands that you're probably already executing. You probably already have these scripts somewhere. So we'll slurp them in and make them chat ups. Then the last bit is we want to create a feedback loop. So the magic is now we've exposed these things to chat ops. What do we actually do with this? Right? It's not enough for me to go like let people know that I'm doing something. I actually want to teach this bot how to go be smarter. Because you know, it turns out I don't really want to manage this app. And even though I'm going to give power back to the users, I bet they don't want to have to come in and tell the cat cam, get rid of your old pictures every once in a while. I bet that's not higher on their priority list. So then you start to create closed loop systems. And this is where we get into the concept of workflows. So instead of just saying, go do this one thing, why don't you go do a ton of things? And that workflow could do things like, from my monitoring alert, go open an issue, right? From my monitoring alert, go let PagerDuty or VictorOps know. 
from my monitoring alert, go and actually run the remediation workflows to go try to fix the commonly executed things. And these all happen in the context of StackStorm from the same trigger that I had before, right? And the thing that's important here is now you've exposed these things and the magic may be happening behind the scenes, but they're seeing visibility. The users who are, are watching this thing get executed, at some point they've executed many times through chat, and now it's being happened automatically. They see these things. They feel trust in these things. And if they want to, they can interject themselves into this and, and interrupt processes, right? You're giving the power back to these users. And when they have that, they're happy, right? So we'll quick, real quick into a workflow. Workflow looks very much like uh, top to bottom. This is one of our workflow examples. This is called Action Chain. We have multiple workflows. I'm happy to talk about those. But this is very simple, right? Go do some notification, and then go figure out what my next thing is. It's just here are the steps, the logical actions I want to go execute. And they could be happy path. They could take a lot complex logic, right? So depending on how complex you want to be, you can take any number of paths. And the beauty about this is, is that now you don't have to write super complex logic in the actual chat ops actions. What the hard part about it is, is usually what ends up happening is you get these really large scripts that try to take into account all of the things you need to care about, the logging, the security, the history, all of these things. And these scripts that run in the context of chat ops become behemoths. In our context, we want these atomic actions to be as small as possible, because we're going to chain them together. And so now you, as an author, really only have to care about your domain of responsibility. If I only need to manage the MySQL servers, my action only needs to manage the MySQL servers. Stackstorm and its collaboration with Hubot will take care of everything else around you. The security, the audit, the history, a web GUI, bunch of things, right? And even if this doesn't work, right? Even if you've gone through all of this exercise and the bot can't automatically remediate, you've still done yourself a service. Because now, at least when you get woken up, you know there's a real issue because the bot's already tried to do some things. And it's told you about these things. And maybe it's had some success, but it still needs your help. And so now when you get called, you can actually be like paid for what you get paid to do, which is be smart and go fix things, not clean up cat pictures. So Backstorm, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I, I hope that maybe you think it might be pretty cool. Um, you know, we've got a web GUI. It's really neat. Uh, we have an installer. So if you don't even know how to like do this thing, we've got a, a Vagrant image that you can download. It has an installer. It will hook up chat ops for you automatically. We have AMIs that will be coming out in the next couple weeks pending uh, Amazon approval. And then shortly thereafter, we'll be having things like Google uh, GCE images and Amazon Azure or Azure images. Like basically, if you can run this thing, we want you to be able to run it, right? Hey, look at that. See, you can go through workflows. It's kind of neat. I think it's kind of neat. But why, right? Why, why go through all this effort? The effort's about having a shared context, having a shared command line, right? Because it turns out that humans talking in a chat room is just a different kind of bus, a little bit slower. But in the end, it's the same concept. And by integrating and implementing these tools, you can accelerate your speed, which you execute, come faster, and have more fun with how you do things. So if you have any questions, we have plenty of resources for you. We have a Slack channel where we hang out all day, every day. You can come visit us, answer any questions about how we do things, maybe get started with StackStorm. Uh, we have plenty of documentation on how to get started. We are completely 100% open source. So if you want to go try this out, go for it. We want feedback. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thanks so much for having me. Any questions or am I over time? I think I'm over time. I think I did two presentations, though, technically. <laughs> yeah, what? Sure. Since your software is all open source, what is it? What is the commercial aspect? Yeah, so the good question, right? So the, you know, uh, if we're open source, what is it that we're actually selling, right? So we believe that StackStorm, uh, our end state is this idea of event-driven automation, right? ChatUps for us is a, is a step in that journey. And a lot of times, folks just aren't even ready for this step, right? They're still at, like, we've got configuration management. Maybe we just got that down, right? Now you're going to say, I'm going to go do this ChatUps thing. Well, chat ops is important because now we can go in and we say, you want to be an event-driven automation, plug your things into StackStorm and chat ops, and go run these things. 
what we're actually going to sell is an analytics platform. And so now we'll be able to make recommendations about what your actually your users are doing, how your system is running, and then make recommendations about what remediation workflows may look like for you and whatnot. So the platform itself, consuming it, all open source, right? Getting information and knowledge about how to be smarter and stuff. Maybe you could help us out. We can help you out. Yes, sir. Just two points of clarification. One, the type one link is on top of your page. That's how you can come sign up for the community on the if you want to. It's closed. It's closed. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. I know you always have to be a center. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Sorry. No, the, the other point is. Um, it's not a corporate laptop. You <laughs> also heard a big Thank you. Yeah, so we have a rapid prototyping environment called the ST2 Workroom. So we firmly believe that if we're running a development environment, it should be the same development environment that you run. So the Workroom is responsible for uh, the, the how our developers actually write code. So they use that as their main development environment. It is also our what we call our reference infrastructure. So you can download the ST2 Workroom, and it will download what we our pristine copy of Stackstorm. It'll actually install some basic constructs for you. It'll bootstrap the bot for you. It'll configure the bot. It'll connect it to the chat service. It'll do all the things necessary. That is, this is a giant pain in the ass to do, I promise. And if you want to try to do it on your own, go for it. Do it. You're going to learn a lot, and then give me a call, right? I'll help you out. So yeah, you can download that project, uh, the ST2 workroom on our GitHub web page, like also open source. Um, but it's the same. The thing that's in the ST2 workroom is the same code that's on our AWS images, that will be on our uh, GCE and Azure images. So the code's consistent. Have a ball. Go look at it. Give us feedback. What else? Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, I think it, you know, from that end, what we're trying to do is uh, provide an engine that gives you the integrations and the ability to write workflows that make sense for you, right? So, like in some concepts, in, in some uh, in some orgs. Their act is happening at the monitoring system. In some orgs, their act is happening at the alerting system, right? Depending whatever your workflow is. Um, and as a matter of fact, we also already have uh, both PagerDuty and VictorOps integrations that you can download like within four seconds, and then go go do those things. Act alerts from there. You know, do whatever you need to do. It's pretty much a, like a workflow design pattern. Yeah. Things really would come down to because a lot of the time, what we see is that if you have uh, valid tested uh, diagnostic workflows. It is currently, um, and we uh, actually we started with MongoDB so that in the beginning while we were developing, we could not worry so much about schema and like get some actual code written. So on our roadmap, we're actually moving to Postgres as part of our 1.0 or shortly thereafter 1.0 and unifying a lot of the databases underneath. So Mongo will not be there long term. Yep, we get that feedback a lot actually. So <laughs> as you can imagine, right?